Good morning. Welcome, welcome to Older Nation Episcopal Church for our Sunday Eucharist. We have combined the two services again, and uh, and maybe Richard will turn me down a little bit because I got a uh, little more volume than I need. I think um, we've combined the two services, one from the church and the one in here today, because we are doing something unique that we do every few years, not on a regular basis, but every once in a while we do an instructed Eucharist, where we will explain, I'll have running commentary all through the service, explaining what we are about to do and why, and the background, and you won't have to listen to a sermon in addition, just, uh, yeah, yeah. Some, some very generous people said, oh, and uh, I think it was my wife but who really meant, <laughs> We really meant thank you, thank you. Um, but, uh, but we are going to uh, run through uh, the whole service as a normal service. It will include all the other things other than the sermon, uh, but we are going to have a running commentary. So I want to start with a couple of words about how we will begin the liturgy. Before even the New Testament was written down and people started to use it as a guide for how they might worship, early Christians gathered as a community both on Saturday in order to celebrate the Sabbath and remember the Sabbath, but then again on Sunday as a community where they would celebrate the resurrection. And so what happened was a regular pattern of worship, of breaking bread and prayers, that happened every time they came, and they came to know that they could not live their faithful Christian life without also having worship as a regular part of their life. And the Holy Eucharist is how we celebrate and continue that pattern. Everything in our service is there for a reason. It's part of the pattern of worship from the very beginning but it's also part of a specific sequence that is designed to help us learn how to live our life Monday through Saturday as well. It is all choreographed, if you could think of it, as a divine ballet. And those of you who know ballet or dance or any kind of musical opera, uh, in the same way the Eucharist has things in particular spots for particular reasons. It's designed to teach us, to feed us with what we need of God's presence, and to inspire us to go out and live that way in the world every day. And ritual, which we have a lot of in our worship, is symbolic action and language, which when repeated, has the potential benefit of shaping and molding our lives. One intention of Christian liturgy is to come close, to encounter. One of the meanings of the word worship is to come close and encounter God. But another meaning and intention of the Eucharist is to help learn this pattern of coming before God, listening to God's word, confessing our sins, being forgiven, and then learning how to go and participate in sharing God's body so that we can share God's body with the rest of the world. Holy Eucharist is the only service that Jesus specifically instituted and commanded should be done. He does that at the Last Supper when he says, when you gather together, do this in remembrance of me. And Eucharist literally is from the Greek word which means thanksgiving. And we give thanks to God when we gather for the work that God has done in feeding, inspiring, and sending us and giving our lives purpose. We talk of it as a sacrament because it is, as all Episcopalians at some point learn, it is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace, meaning we do physical things that can be seen and heard and experienced, tasted and touched. And we do those physical things, but they are really trying to convey 
inward spiritual things and help our whole process of understanding. So the Eucharist, we call the work of the people, liturgy. Liturgy literally is the work of the people or work of God for the people. Two ways to understand it. And in such, everyone has a role. You don't come to do the Eucharist as an audience. Every Sunday, you know, in our style of worship, you are a participant. And the Eucharist cannot be celebrated by a priest on their own. It always requires two people as a minimum. And the best way it is done is when the whole community is gathered. In the whole service as we go through, we will have a number of what I call personal acts of piety. And I'll explain some of them as we go through this instruction. Things like making the sign of the cross, things like bowing or genuflecting in some churches. Uh, all of these are what I call acts of piety, acts of our spiritual worship, which are helpful when you understand them, but none of them are required. And in the Episcopal Church, we have all different styles because we come from very evangelical Protestant traditions as well as very Catholic uh, and Orthodox traditions. And in doing so, we always have said it's a blend and therefore no one has to do any of these things. But sometimes when you understand what's happening, it becomes an enhancement a possibility for understanding and participating deeper with your faith and your worship. And so when it becomes understandable, I encourage you, if it's helpful, do it. If it's a distraction, then don't do it, and it's all okay. okay? The big Book of Common Prayer, where all of our liturgies come from, is also a place where if you know your Bible well enough, uh, Everything we have to say, almost 85% of it is almost a direct steal from the Bible. There are people who started reading the Bible after they were trained as Episcopalians for all their childhood, and they say, look, the Bible is really written from the Book of Common Prayer. <laughs> In our worship, you will find that we have two parts, and they are separated by the piece, and we're going to explain them as we go along. But we basically have a service of the word, of listening to God's scripture, of meditating on it, and learning how to practice it. And we have the service of the table. In some churches, the table is known as the altar. But in truth, the theology changed really from the Reformation on to say it's not an altar, which is basically what happens at a tomb but rather a table around which we are all gathered. And you'll notice when we offer the service of the table that we will have people all around the table every time. And in truth, if you could see it extending into the congregation, it symbolizes the fact that we are all standing around the table when we do Eucharist. And so imagine yourself not as back there, but actually taking one of the places around the table. If we could make it zoom out into the congregation like you could on a, on a video game, uh, all of you are participants at the table of God. If you also think about the service that we have, the road to Emmaus story in, God, in the Gospel according to Luke is the pattern for what we do on Sunday morning. Jesus walks along catches up to the disciples, explains the scriptures to understand his own work, and then sits at their table and breaks the bread, and as he blesses the wine, they have their eyes opened. And then they realize that Jesus was present to them in the breaking open of the word of scripture and in the breaking open of the sacrament at table, bread and wine. Before the processional starts, it's a time for us to get ready. And normally when we come in without somebody giving you this commentary, uh, we would have silence when it's best. When we do it right, we would always have a moment of silence to prepare. Say your prayers of asking God to be with you. Read the lessons ahead that are printed in your bulletins. Or take the hymn texts that are printed in your bulletins or in the hymnal 
and read through the text of the hymns. All of these are ways to transition from the world outside of busyness into a world of encountering God's presence in this community. So we will stand and sing the processional hymn, and then I'll have a little commentary that goes after the words of acclamation, and, um, and we're already through a significant part, so it won't always be this long. Please stand. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be the kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Join me in praying. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we sing our song of praise, the children are invited to follow the crucifer to Children's Chapel.
Please be seated. Worship that we are beginning is a work, an act of trying to give value to God in our life and return it in praise and thanksgiving. Worship literally comes from a word that is the same root as worthy or worth it. And so when we worship, you could think of we are giving value as we give worth to God in our lives and reflecting that when we come together. We began with the acclamation, blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or some other acclamation. And it states the purpose of our worship. What we are trying to do is bless God and bless us as part of God's kingdom. That's why the language is stated as such. We make the sign of the cross as we do that to affirm that blessing that we are praying for and saying, I accept God's blessing to bless God and bless God's kingdom as part of my own life. The colic for purity that we all pray together, which used to be, if you were from old school Episcopal church, was just done by the priest, has more and more become a community prayer and the prayer literally asks the Holy Spirit to come and cleanse us and prepare us by preparing our hearts and allowing the Holy Spirit to come and do that work of making us ready to receive God's presence. It's, as we say, the words are inspire and comes from the same root as saying inspiritus in Greek, which means, come Holy Spirit into me. I'm praying this in the Spirit, asking God to give me the Spirit, which is to inspire. As we do, we then enter into praise. It is always, as we did, glory, glorify your name, or the Gloria, or the Kyrie. They are all hymns of offering God praise and as we do that, then the celebrant addresses you and says, the Lord be with you, and you all know to say, and also, also with you. you. And if you think about it, we do it so routinely, it just becomes rote. But think about what you just said. You're inviting God's presence. The Lord be with you, and also with you, is a way to invite God at the very beginning of our worship to be part of everything we do with each and every one of us. Then we have the collect for the day. the day. The collect is a prayer which defines from the scriptures that we will hear what is it that we are going to get out of those readings. And the collect always tries to summarize some key point of the scripture readings that we'll have. And then we'll have four readings, uh, Old Testament, Psalm, Epistle, and Gospel almost every Sunday. And if you, uh, if you are a purist, you would sing the psalm. I think somebody suggested we do that a couple weeks ago when we weren't ready to do that. <laughs> but remember that the psalm was the, prayer, the hymnal, the book of Psalms was the hymnal for the people of Israel. And so if we really did it the best way, we would always sing the psalm, although a lot of times it's more comfortable to read for some of us. The gospel we stand for because we are inviting God's presence among us, and these are the words of Jesus himself. And so we stand and respect, in respect and honor of the fact that we are going to hear the gospel proclaimed. And so one of the traditions that we have is wherever you are seated, you turn and face the priest as that gospel or the deacon as that gospel lesson is read. And if you notice, we try to bring it into the center of the congregation, not here or at the altar, which it could be done. But the tradition is bring the gospel out to the people because the gospel is always moving with the people where they go. We will now uh, continue on with the rest of the liturgy through the gospel, and then I will pick it up again. So please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. 
Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the lessons. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I, where I have driven them and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Canticle 16 is printed in your bulletin. We will read it responsively by half verse. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has, he has raised up for us a mighty Savior. Born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies. He promised to show mercy to our fathers. And to remember his holy this was the oath he swore to our father Abraham. Free to worship him without fear. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High. to give his people knowledge of salvation. In the tender compassion of our God. To shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Is now and will be forever. Amen. A reading from Colossians. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transformed us in the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, 
For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile him, reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. The word of the Lord. Please stand as you are able and let us sing, Speak, O Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. 
Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Now that we have heard the scriptures, which are intended to give us a record of God speaking to God's people, we are ready for the sermon, which has the intention of breaking open the word, making it so it is understandable for our own personal lives and for the life of our community. It's the same pattern that we will follow when we go to the table of having bread and wine presented, but then broken in a way that it can be then shared. And the sermon's intention is to be able to help whatever the scriptures were break open in a way that we can not only understand them, but then share them rest with the rest of the world. And as you saw, we stand for the gospel because it is the word of Christ spoken to God's people that is intended to be proclaimed out into the world. Now our sermon is intended to have meaning for daily living, sometimes encouragement, sometimes admonishment when we need it, sometimes instruction, sometimes inspiration. At one time or another in our life, the Word speaks to us in different ways but it always should be heard as good news. And the preacher, if we are doing the work well, helps to explain the scriptures in a way that it can become good news, which sometimes means a kick in the rear end. <laughs> when I was a preacher in Alabama, uh, I had a guy who came out of a very Pentecostal church background. Um, and after being there about six months, he said, just know that I'm not going to be here about once a month because I need to go back to the Pentecostal church and every once in a while I'll get yelled at. <laughs> and you don't yell at me very often. But in truth, he's speaking a word of actual need for all of us because the scriptures should be things from which we hear every time something new, something that we hadn't thought of or something that we heard of but we haven't been doing. And that's the point of this word of being broken open in the sermon. The next thing after we do that is to affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. The creeds were originally written as baptismal statements, but by the fourth century it was recognized that we needed comprehensive sorts of statements that could guide our faith, that could summarize the key essentials. It does not try to explain and take care of everything. Even though I said it's comprehensive, it's comprehensive only in the sense that it takes the very core of our belief and tries to summarize in that way to give a bit of a statement of who we are, who we know God to be, and the work that God has done in Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So we say those words. Oftentimes I have people say, I don't know what it really means. How can I say it week after week? And I say, it's not my creed or this church's creed or your creed. It is the creed of the church universal from the very beginnings of our faith. This was a way to define the whole of what we have as core. Therefore, in the Nicene Creed, we use we believe, not I believe, because we have to remember always that it is bigger than my own understanding, bigger than my own belief, because I am growing all the time. And the only way it starts to make sense is by repeating, letting it seep into my own sensibility, and then continuing to grow as I understand more and more. My life of faith is always changing and adapting and growing. 
There's no one time where it is finished. As we finish the the creeds, we move into the prayers of the people. And if you want to know what the mission of the church is all about, read the prayers of the people. If you're ever wondering why the church is doing all these things out in the world, read the prayers of the people. Because every time we do them, we pray for the church, we pray for the world, we pray for our nation, we pray for our neighbors, we pray for ourselves. And the healing that the world needs and the church needs and the nation needs and I need is being wrapped up and expressed in those prayers. When we do them right, it will include your intercessions and thanksgivings. And there's always a place where we say, including your intercessions and thanksgiving silently or aloud. And that's your opportunity to add the things you personally are praying for in the midst of the prayers of the community. At some point then, we move into the confession and absolution, and we have already heard the word of God. We prayed for our own needs in the prayers of the people, and we've been confronted by our sin There's hardly a week that goes by and I listen to the scriptures and I don't say, oh crap, I was supposed to be doing that, right? Or I need to change this. I need to reform my life in this way. And I am confronted by the words of of scripture. And that's why every service also we have the confession and absolution where we pray first individually in the silence about the things I know in my own heart I need to be reformed of. And then we have a general confession that is wrapping up all the things that we always are part of. And in doing so, we are asking God to reconcile us in our relationship with God and with each other. And then after it is over and we prayed for things done and things left undone, we then hear the priest pronounce forgiveness from God. It is not the priest who is forgiving you, although the priest always should. It is God who is more trustworthy than the priest. (laughs) And therefore, God has given this uh, responsibility to those who declare forgiveness on God's behalf. When we do that, we know that God is the forgiver and we can trust that God forgives us of anything that's gone on and asks us to now do the things we just committed to, right? At that point, we move into the peace, which is the sacramental acting out of the reconciled whole body, whole in the sense of we've been made healed and whole. And so through the process of hearing Scripture, confessing our sins, being absolved, we know that we are now healed people if we are willing to act on that. And in doing so, God reconciles us to God, but that reconciliation always requires we are reconciling with our neighbors. And that's why the peace happens next. Because what happens is a liturgical action, a sacramental action of acting out the fact that now we trust God has reconciled us this way, and our job is to take that reconciliation with everyone else here and become a reconciled body. And in doing so, we go around and we may shake hands or hug or kiss um, or wave the sign of the peace to someone you can't get to. But in truth, it is a liturgical sacramental action. It is not saying, oh, Vaughn, how good it is to see you today. How are you doing? How was your week? That's called coffee hour. One of the reasons why you hear me oftentimes sort of half-jokingly say, okay, that's enough peace, is because I realize that the sacramental action has morphed into a time of just sharing and catching up. The peace is intended as a sacrament, as a way, an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual peace that is now granted. And therefore, it ought to do that work of reconciling but it is not coffee hour. Keep the the chatter down uh, where you're trying to catch up and let it be what it is supposed to be. 
Now we're going to continue with, uh, with a af affirmation, affirmation of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. Please stand. One God, the Father, the Father of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people continues in your bulletin. Heavenly Father, you promised to hear when we pray in the name of your Son. Therefore, listen as we lift our voices in confidence and trust. We pray for the leaders of the church, especially Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, our bishop, our clergy, Bob, Lissy, and Fred, and for all the people within the church, enliven us all for your mission that we may be salt of the earth and light to the world. We pray for the world, creator of all, lead us and all people into ways of justice and peace. That we may work for freedom and truth. We pray for our community. God of truth, inspire with your wisdom those whose decisions affect the lives of others, including our President Joe, our Congress, our Governor Glenn, and our Mayors Bobby and Kenny, and all others in places of authority. That all may act with integrity, courage, and compassion for the common good. We pray for all who are in need. Please add your own thanksgiving and petitions silently or aloud. Such as the Dave Wilkinson. God of hope, comfort and restore all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. May they know the power of your healing love. We remember with thanksgiving those who have died in the faith of Christ and those whose faith is known to you alone. Father, into your hands we commend them. We pray for those who serve our country and those who are deployed especially Patrick McHugh, Maggie Wall, and Chet Shutak. Lord, you have called all of us to serve you. Grant that we may walk in your presence, your love in our hearts, your truth in our minds, your strength in our wills. Amen. In the silence, let us remember our own faults and failings.
in the community of Christ's Christ Church, Church and in, and the, in presence the presence of all God's people, people I, I confess to God that, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed, things, things done and left, left undone. undone. I, I have not, not loved God or God's people and creation fully. I own my responsibility, commit to follow God's path, and pray for God's pardon. May God forgive you, Christ befriend you, the Spirit renew you, and change your life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Okay, just a um, couple words of announcement. Um, first of all, this is the last Sunday before uh, Advent starts. Believe it or not, Advent starts next Sunday. Um, so we are approaching the season of Christmas. Um, so next Sunday, the tone and the liturgy will change in lots of ways. It'll seem a little different because it is intentionally different, just like we're talking um, there are lots of things happening. I want to make sure you know on Thursday at 10 o'clock on Thanksgiving Day, we always have Eucharist at 10 o'clock with music and traditional Thanksgiving Day hymns. So come and join us and give thanks to God for your life and for this last year especially, and, uh, and we will worship together. Also, um, I want to uh, remind you that uh, some of you who have middle schoolers, if they want to go to Apex with Brian Parks and Greg Randall, uh, they're taking the group uh, on the bus down to uh, Apex at about 3.15 is the right time they will leave here, and they will go to Apex at Town Center for an hour of arcade, two games of laser tag, and... Uh, and I'm not able to go, unfortunately, because uh, I'm going to Eastern Shore Chapel for the high schoolers who are meeting there at 6.30 to talk about our joint pilgrimage that we're going to do with Eastern Shore Chapel next June for 10 days to Ireland. And if you have any high schoolers that are interested in that and you have questions, uh, try to make the meeting at 6.30 at Eastern Shore. I'll be leaving here about 6.00. To 610 after the five o'clock service ends and we can uh, caravan on our way down if anybody wants to join me and I do have some seats in the car okay um, so middle school at 315 high schoolers leaving here about six for a meeting at Eastern Shore Chapel at 630 so big things happening there okay um, I will give you a, uh, a short update uh, about Dave Wilkinson who had another week of progress, but a little setback and then more progress. So uh, he's back in ICU, which he had gotten out of last week at the beginning of this week. Um, but he had some infection take over again and get worse. So he's back in ICU with much better, uh, much better status at this point. Okay. And Gretchen? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm almost there. I'm almost there, yes. <laughs> Um, yesterday we had oyster roast and we did fabulously um, and thank you because almost everybody in this room was here working or buying and sharing in the fun day we had almost as many people I think as we've ever had at any of our oyster roast but it never felt crowded because we have all this extra space now 
but it worked marvelously well because we had so many of you come and help make it work. The tally for yesterday is not finished completely, but we think we actually had gross receipts of all, a right around $15,000. That's not... That's not bad work for five hours of work, right? Uh, that's a pretty good deal. Um, and, uh, well, some of us... Some of us worked a lot more than five hours. But it worked well, and this became an open house for the whole community, and we had just a tremendous turnout. So thank you all for providing word-of-mouth promotion to your friends and family and, uh, and for showing up, Okay. After that, we still have a few things left. So in the back wing, uh, in the Salisbury conference room, we have uh, the leftovers from the best of the uh, white elephant sale, the jewelry and artwork and some other things that are actually of some value are in the room right now. So make your way back after the service is over and, uh, and enjoy. There's a few more things that you might want for Christmas gifts. So do that. There's also, if you pre-ordered barbecue or Brunswick stew, they have that to give to you as well out in the narthex here. And the coffee hour is be, being sponsored and hosted uh, by Buildings and Grounds. And if you're interested in how we take care of things around here and think that might be a project for you, speak to people in the, uh, in the narthex around coffee hour table. Okay? Mike, you have something else to say also, so say it at the lectern. And, uh, yep. Uh, good morning. We just, Stewardship Commission wanted everybody to know that um, Old Donation is now an approved charity under the Amazon Smile program. Uh, so it's been live for a few months now. I think we've raised about 100 or received about $160 so far. Uh, but we wanted to make a push, obviously, with the holiday season coming up, if you're going to not support small business and order through Amazon. Um, <laughs> for family or friends, uh, it's, it's really easy. You go to smile.amazon.com, select old donation uh, from the, the search area, and once you do that and bookmark smile.amazon.com, I think half a percent of all of your eligible, eligible purchases will come to old donation in perpetuity as long as the program's up and running. Um, you can also do it on the mobile app. There's a, a second step to do that. But if you have any questions or would like help or would like me to walk you through setting that up for your Amazon account, I'll be in the narthex following the service. Um, but yeah. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I'm speaking from Mel Melissa, so and she can tell me if I missed something. But uh, outreach has two major projects. We always start right about now. Uh, one is the angel tree will be up. Is it already up and ready? Coming this, week. Coming this week. So you'll see it next Sunday. And also we are doing a toy collection for the Urban Renewal Council, which we are a participant in uh, with Antipas Harris, uh, who is doing some really, really good work with, uh, with families who don't have enough resources of their own. And so we're collecting any toys of any sort, and they will be sorted out and given away through the Urban uh, Renewal gr Group. So that's happening too. Any other announcements I need to make? I'm forgetting. Uh, adult Forum right after the service. Yes. And then um, office is closed, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Yeah, no, no office, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We always only have a half day on Wednesday, but the internet will be down all day Wednesday, so we're staying home, okay? <laughs> and uh, thank you. And Melissa, one other thing? Thank you, thank you. That's always helpful to know. There's lots of things going on around here that you don't see, so all good. Thank you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Oh. Please be seated. After the peace, we move to the liturgy of the table and the sacramental action of taking bread and wine, and it has now been presented and is prepared at the altar. Symbolically, if you could imagine the altar all the way through the middle, as I said before, we are supposed to be gathering as a community around the table rather than you out there and the priest and the table up here. And so we always surround the table with Eucharistic ministers and other acolytes as a symbolic way of saying the whole community is gathered together. The priest can never do Eucharist on their own, always requires a congregation, and this is where it gets critical. We are mirroring in this account at the table, that of the feeding of the 5,000 as well as the Last Supper. And in those accounts, if you go back and look at them closely, you will see there are four actions, four actions that we repeat. One is to take, just as Jesus received the young boy's offering of five loaves and two fish, we take the offering of the congregation And it is presented to God for God to bless, which is the second action. And then it is broken, just as Jesus' own body was broken on the cross. And then finally given back to the community as blessed sacramental feeding to inspire us and give us God's strength and presence so that we can go out and do the same thing in the rest of the world. So at offertory, we bring the bread and the wine, but we also bring the monies that we offer to God. And when we do that, we are actually doing the same thing with our money, what happens with bread and wine. They are all products of God's gift, grape and wheat, that then we take with our own agency and work with and then present it as bread and wine. And that's the way all of life works. God gives us raw talents or raw materials. And your job and my job is to work with them so that they are prepared to do the kind of things God wants us to do. So our collection works through this process. Um, It is all presented at the altar where we will give thanks, we'll break it apart and give it back to the world. The Eucharistic prayer that we're about to hear and participate in begins, as we say, to lift your hearts to the Lord. And we are lifted out of time and space into the divine presence. You notice the language, lift our hearts up to the Lord. Eucharist does not take place here in this room. Eucharist is always taken about around the heavenly table. And so what we are trying to say by our words and action is that we are being united to God in this prayer. And it is what we have a fancy theological term for, which is called prolepsis or proleptic action. What's happening is all of time is being merged together. And the story of the Last Supper, where Jesus gathered his disciples and said, do this in remembrance of me, is a prayer that happened in the past, but actually is a representation of what is happening in the future at the last day when we are all together at the table with all those who have gone on before and all those who come after. The whole community of the faithful people are gathered around this table with you. 
And I always say at funerals, as an example, we are participating with those who have gone before whenever we come and receive the bread and the wine. We are receiving in that in communion with the saints. And the prayer summarizes what God has done to save us. The story of the Last Supper, hope for new life, Holy Spirit stamped on the bread and wine. Pray that, make, that they make for us signs of God's presence with us. And that through receiving God's presence, we pray God transforms us, making us signs of God's presence when we leave into the world. We pray that all time is really truly merged and that what we participate in now is actually the Last Supper at the end of time, not the one 2,000 years ago. The specifics of the Eucharistic prayer that you will hear and participate in are anamnesis, a word that literally means remembering what God has done in the past. You'll hear always, what has God done for us? And it's an easy thing to remember that is a word of remembering, not forgetting, because it's the opposite. Anamnesis is the opposite of amnesia. Okay? And then we have words of institution where we say the same things Jesus said at the table. And then we have words of epiclesis, which is the giving of the Holy Spirit to bless the bread and wine and bless us. And oftentimes you'll see the priests and other people, and it's invited for everyone, if it helps you, uh, to make the sign of the cross because we're praying that the Holy Spirit actually comes and dwells within this body. And so I make the sign of the cross as I do that in a way to say I am being branded with God's sign because I know I'm inviting God to be with me through the power of the Holy Spirit. The ceremonial actions might be useful to you, but don't let them be a distraction and bother you either if you choose not to do it. At the end of the prayer, Lizzie will build in almost a crescendo as it says uh, we come to the finished prayer before the Lord's Prayer, and it should be a crescendo crescendo to which you are invited to end with amen and i always say it's best done if you all shout it uh you don't have to yell but sh shout it in the most respectful but broad bold way because amen literally means so be it or be it with me or yes and so you are affirming that God has been present in the bread and wine, you have consumed it, and this is a great amen. It's the only one in the entire prayer book that is in all caps, which you know what all caps means when you write that in texts, right? <laughs> right? So shout it out the same way, okay? Now we'll continue. Let's, uh, let's begin with the Eucharistic prayer. Right, uh, right beside Lizzie. Right beside her. Come on, take it. It'll be right there. Okay. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. Glory, Glory to you forever and ever. You have filled us in all creation with your blessing and fed us with your constant love. You have redeemed us in Jesus Christ and knit us into one body. Refresh and renew us by the power of your spirit. Transformed by your love, we join the saints and angels in proclaiming your glory as we sing. Oh. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
We give thanks to you, O God, that when we failed to honor your image in one another and ourselves, you never ceased to care for us. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, Jesus, to live and die as one of us. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. We thank you that on the night before he died for us, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his friends, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, gave it to his friends, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. And so, remembering all that was done for us, we acclaim you, O Christ. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Christ Jesus, come in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be to us the body and blood of your Christ. Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Grant that we, burning with your Spirit's power, may be a people of hope, justice, and love. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we worship you, our God and Creator, in voices of unending praise. Amen. Amen. Hold the bread up high and in silence wait and then take it down and break it just as Jesus' body was broken for us so that it could be shared. And in this triumphal time, we know that what looks like breaking is actually only so that it can be shared. And the priest will invite all to come to the altar and the bread and the wine will be offered. Either or both is sufficient for the reception of Christ's body and blood and God's presence. You don't have to drink both, eat or drink both. One or the other or both is sufficient. And they symbolize one bread, one body, symbolizes the unity we share as Christ's body as we go forth. If you have uh, not received... Um, in the, in the uh, long time in the Episcopal Church tradition, it's very helpful to the chalice bearers. This is practical, not theological. Practical for you to hold the bottom of the chalice and guide it to your mouth. Uh, oftentimes people come from another tradition and they don't know to, that it's okay to touch the chalice. But it is very helpful to them if you guide it and they will have it loosely held so that it can be consumed. And they will hold it up high enough that you don't have to bend down. So uh, come and they will offer it right at your chin level and then you guide it to your mouth. Now we'll continue with the rest of the Eucharistic prayer and communion. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia! The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven be with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven.
we move into the post-communion prayer where we offer thanks to God for this gift that strengthens us and inspires us in a way that we can share Christ's body and blood into the world, doing the same work that Jesus did. The priest will then pronounce God's blessing. Sometimes it carries with it a charge of our responsibility to be active in the mission of Christ. And we will make the sign of the cross blessing with God's blessing all those who leave this place to go out into the world. The processional hymn, just like the beginning hymn, has the function of helping us understand what all of the service is about as a way to follow the cross of Jesus. As he said, if you want to be my disciples, take up your cross and follow me. And so the processional in and the processional out, if we did them properly, everyone in the whole church would follow us around three or four times, <laughs> and then we would make our way out into the world because all processionals are simply representative of the whole congregation. The church is always on pilgrimage into the world. And so imagine that we would have all of you follow the cross around a couple times, and that would be what's really happening, even though we physically are not doing it. We are charged to go out into the world and be the people of God everywhere we go, and worship, which stops short of doing ministry, is sterile and ultimately idolatry because then we've made what we do here the most important piece. And yet this is to instruct us and train us and then equip us to go out into the world and be the church everywhere we go. And so it's not about this time, except this is the way that we are fed and strengthened and instructed to go do our work in the world. Whenever we go and leave this place, we are completing the process that you began on Sunday morning. And wherever we go out of these doors, as I say, the worship might end, but the service begins. Now we'll continue. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So be quick to love, and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us sing, crown him with many crowns.
And I promise it won't be this long next week. (laughs) Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.